And Mevo says we're ready. Hi, everybody. Gray Stallman here. I'm the host of The Doctor Is In, live with TOA. We're here once again on a Friday trying to get you some information about musculoskeletal care and what we do. This young man, well, he's probably my age, uh, Jimmy Phillips is with us today. Uh, he has a really special uh, background that we're going to get into. He's a physical therapist with TOA, but he also has a background as an athletic trainer. And I, we're going to kind of concentrate a little bit on that today because it's an interesting area that TOA works in. Um, a lot of people, if you have kids who play sports, probably are, hopefully, are familiar with uh, athletic training. But it's an interesting field that I think a lot of people will enjoy learning about. So um, we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, first off, um, I hope everybody's uh, staying healthy. I hope everybody is enjoying the fall weather. Um, if you haven't done so, please go out and vote. Uh, I don't care who you vote for. Just exercise your right as an American citizen to vote. It's important. And if you don't vote, you don't have any right to complain, okay? That's my viewpoint. Anyway, um, oh, as usual, um, uh, the information here today is really for your information and educational purposes, maybe a little entertainment. While I'm an orthopedic surgeon, I'm a uh, fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon, I'm not your orthopedic surgeon. So don't, please, don't consider any information we talk about today as uh, medical advice. Go seek out help. You can go to toa.com. You can learn about TOA, Tennessee Orthopedic Alliance, our history, our doctors, our locations, our services. You can even start the process of getting an appointment online or even a telemedicine visit. I did a bunch of telemedicine visits today. Yes, we are still doing telemedicine visits uh, for those people either who can't come to the office or are a little bit afraid because of the COVID situation. We can still give you good care remotely. So it's a, it's a unique tool. Anyway, uh, without further ado, Jimmy Phillips, thanks for being here today. Thanks, um, I never want to presume anything about anybody. I want to let you tell everybody about your deal. Don't let me whitewash it. So tell me a little bit about yourself, your background, your, your history with TOA, and then we can get into the meat of the topic. Gotcha. Well, thanks for having me, first of all, Doc. Um, my background um, with TOA started kind of a long time ago. Um, I went to Middle Tennessee State University. Um, in that process, I was a student athletic trainer, worked with the sports programs at MTSU, got to know Dr. Johns, and then a little later on, I think Dr. Johns, uh, Dr. Jordan came, uh, you know, two of our orthopedic surgeons in our Murfreesboro office. Um, um, Dr. Johns, of course, passed away recently. Um, that said, um, went off to PT school, um, came back to Murfreesboro, um, was working. Dr. Johns, Dr. Jordan had an interest in have, having a physical therapy uh, practice in their office to kind of take care of their folks. Um, so I started working with them in the fall of 97. Of course, uh, some years later, they joined with TOA and uh, brought me along, uh, fortunately. Um, so I've been in our Murfreesboro office since it opened, actually. I think we're just maybe a little over 12 years right. uh, um, gone now. So Awesome. Awesome. And uh, just curious, what brought you to being a student athletic trainer and then taking on both the athletic training and then the physical therapy as a career? Were you an athlete? That might be a, an exaggeration of what it was. <laughs> um, I, I, I enjoyed sports. I played, you know, through high school, uh, played baseball, dabbled in basketball a little bit, played a little bit of golf. Um, um, for sports teams, and I, I like to say um, I, I was good enough to be on most teams, but I contributed very little, which means there was not going to be a collegiate opportunity, um, you know, to go and participate in those sports. So um, I, I, I had kind of thought, you know, looking in high school, what would be a good, good vocation? And looking at all the things that I might do, I thought, well, physical therapy was a good role. So I had a guidance counselor hook me up with um, Kramer. Kramer, you know, sports medicine products. Kramer used to do, maybe they still do, I don't know that they do, um, athletic training workshops for high school huh. students. So you learn some of the basics of athletic training um, in terms of taping and, you know, basic anatomy, you know, a little bit of injury stuff kind of at a high school level. Um, when I went to Middle Tennessee State, I was fortunate to, to be introduced to, to George Camp, uh, the head athletic trainer there for a number of years, um, two and a half decades, I think, Mr. Camp was. Um, and he 
allowed me to be a student trainer. Um, so, you know, in that process, um, you know, we were working with all the, all the sports teams that MTSU had, um, actually had my own team, you know, in the spring semester, my freshman year, more because of lack of staff. <laughs> I knew very little, um, of course, learned through the, that time period. And, and so that's kind of brought me. And of course, that was my association with Dr. Johns and Dr. Jordan, and the rest is history. Right. I mean, it's, uh, it's been a good run. So. Very cool. Very cool. So tell me a little bit about um, your role with TOA, and then also TOA's role in and we're going to be talking about a couple of different things, the athletic training side of things, which is more people on the ground in the schools, and then also the physical therapy side that would probably be more um, relevant to the parents of the athletes. Right, right. <laughs> uh, because you're not, the athletic trainer is not going to really be taking care of the parents of the athletes, but the family and friends of the athletes. Right. So tell me a little bit about your role and where you see TOA in that, in that role. Well, for me, currently, my day by day, I, I work at our TOA office in Murfreesboro, and I, and I function more as a physical therapist. Of course, there's a lot of overlap in the roles that a physical therapist would be perform as well as athletic trainers. Af athletic trainers do um, participate a lot in the rehab process, but for me, day by day, um, I'm there at the office, and I, you know, take care of our folks, uh, you know, as as they land on my schedule and. Um, that's primarily my role. So I'm not doing traditional. Traditional athletic training would be more um, the average person. If they thought about an athletic trainer, they'd think, oh, somebody's injured during the football game. Part of the group of people that runs on the field that looks after that, that injured athlete is going to be probably a couple of athletic trainers. And then there's probably a, 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 a physician, most commonly an orthopedic surgeon, that's also in that group. Um, as far as... Um, how I interact. We have, um, you know, we see a lot of local athletes that come to us for, and especially talking about the high school athletes that our um, that our organization, that the TOA um, takes care of and helps participate in the in the healthcare of. Um, they come to us, you know, if someone tears their ACL, they see us for for therapy. They're probably come to see us a couple of times a week, uh, a week, which means they're not seeing us five days a week. Um, if if the typical referrals twice a week for therapy. So we'll communicate and we'll kind of use our high school athletic trainers um, in the rehab processes on the days that they're not coming to see us, um, which works out, I think, well in terms of um, giving, you know, athletes and families more, um, giving them not having to worry about compliance, you know, home programs, that sort of stuff as much if they're going in the training room and seeing the athletic trainers. But, but our, we'll communicate what we, we're doing and what we would like for them to carry out um, there in the, in the high schools, um, within the facilities um, that they have, um, we communicate that to, to the athletic trainers. So we're kind of, they get rehab more frequently than they would otherwise, which we hope helps with outcomes and lessons, complications, et cetera. You know, fewer mo issues with motion, um, you know, probably a better long-term outcome because that they have that more extensive involvement. And I would imagine that that athletic trainer in the school is also a good mode of communication with the coaching staff and the strength training staff um, to facilitate that information because not not everything you tell a parent or a child gets to that level and so the more ways that people can provide communication and provide education I think that's probably a big value absolutely and I think people. I think too from a protection you know if we you know we our doctors do things that can be broken if the progression, um, is not carried out, you know, in a safe manner, in a timely manner. So, so the athletic trainers being kind of a, you know, um, referee, if you will, of making sure that that athletes, strength strength staff, coaches don't maybe do things a little bit too early. You know, we always want our athletes to get out there and, and to participate, return to, to to their full prior pre injury status as soon as possible. Um, but but trying to make sure that's done in a safe manner. You know, we say, I, I didn't want the first surgery. I sure enough don't want the second one. <laughs> you know, that's kind of the idea. Kind of the anti-knucklehead information Absolutely. exchange. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, so in your physical therapy practice, um, I imagine you see all comers. You know, the athletes, but you also probably see grandma with a total knee replacement mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Um, is there a is there a role of your athletic training experience? Uh, how does that mesh with how you advise Mrs. Smith, who's just had her knee replaced? 
Well, I, I think, so athletic training, the misnomer is, all right, you have to be an active participating athlete. Um, if I have, um, you know, a, a young young person, I'll just always use the ACL as the, as the example. There's a ton of different things that we see, obviously. Um, you know, the goal is to restore them to their pre-injury status, um, running, jumping, et cetera. Now, grandma with the total knee may not have, you know, ran and jumped in, in, in years because she had a deteriorating knee that didn't allow her to do those things. But her expectation is to be able to return to a, a functional status regardless of what her that is better than before her, her knee started going downhill. So, so she probably wants to return back to walking on the greenway. Well, she may want to return back to doubles tennis um, because she did that and her knee hasn't allowed her to participate that well. She may want to go play 36 holes of golf. Um, you know, so it's not, um, you don't have to be um, a, a, an athlete in its traditional sense in order to benefit from some of that, that type of a mindset or, or skill set maybe. Um, it, you don't have to be in that in that role to um, to be able to benefit from maybe some of those um, some of some of the the skills that I guess you utilize as an athletic trainer. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really the mantra, and that's really been the mantra of TOA. Um, our last Facebook Live was uh, I went down to uh, the Sports Performance Center down in Franklin mm -hmm. and talked to Les Whitley, who's now manager there, and while he. Well, the, the, the program is designed to get elite, elite athletes back to that level. The desire is actually essentially to treat everyone as if they are an athlete of some form or another. They may not be getting paid to do their, their um, I'm sorry, their um, avocation, but it's still part of their lifestyle and they want to enjoy lifestyle. And so if everybody kind of manage, maintains that high level of, of focus on uh, uh, return to function and return, I think everybody wins. Right. Uh, so you don't have to be an athlete to benefit from athletic training mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, if you treat everybody like an athlete, you probably elevate their ability to improve their overall function if they buy into it. Which I think there's a lot of research in, in regards to, especially recovery after joint replacement, that suggests that there's times that, that we as rehab professionals don't push people far enough, don't we? We, we set the bar too low for expectations. Um, and, you know, kind of, you know, I'd say I don't, I, I think from, from our standpoint in our office, we probably kind of hopefully do a good job of treating right. everybody, pushing them appropriately. I don't think we treat the 18 year old um, that much differently from a, in terms of just the philosophy, the rehab philosophy, than we do the the sixty five year old. I, I think uh, if that one pound weight's too easy, let's go up to a two. I mean, it is a what I like to say is a progressive, not necessarily aggressive mindset when it comes to those types of things, as it's appropriate and safe, of course. Sure, absolutely. So, what are your thoughts? Uh, so, and I have a kind of a personal interest in this. What are your thoughts about the concept of prehab for? And I, it, uh, that's my term, I think. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. prehab is essentially rehab before you undergo a reconstructive type of procedure to try to maximize function prior to something like surgery mm -hmm. in order to kind of start back at a higher level than you would have been had you been doing nothing. Is that is that a reasonable thing to consider in certain things? I think it has a great value on, on a few different fronts. So, so the things that we see commonly for prehab would be um, knee ligament tears, trying to restore range of motion prior to surgery. And I think, you know, if you restore, you know, if we're talking about a knee, get it straight, get it bent. You know, if you can go into surgery with full range of motion, it puts you at, a, at, a, at an advantage post-op. Whereas you're at a big disadvantage post-op if you go in with a contract, you know, with a knee flexion contracture, not being able to extend the knee, um, I think it has a huge help. I think the the biggest thing I find through the, when, when we have the opportunity to see one prior someone prior to a uh, procedure like that is the educational component, what to expect. Because I found, um, and we have several of our physicians that prior to, especially total joint, will refer to us for one single pre-op visit. Mm -hmm. In that pre-op visit, we're talking about. You know, if it's a total knee, we're talking about the importance of early extension, motion in general, but extension in particular. We're talking about um, 
what to expect. Um, you know, right? Your weight bearing is tolerated. Um, you can't mess it up by moving it. Um, those things that, that, that can be, what I found over the years, the fear of doing something, messing it up, um, it, it's, a, it's a good fear in a sense, but there's certain things that people might be afraid of that, that if they're afraid of it, they're not gonna push it and it's okay to push it and it can affect or, or kind of delay at the point that they are happy with their joint post-op. So if they're afraid to bend it because they're gonna, they're, they're worried they're, they might stretch their incision, well, that's not generally gonna happen. You know, don't let that keep you from pushing into some discomfort. Um, you, again, just knowing generally, all right, you know, we're gonna, you're gonna come out weight bearing this tolerated, but you're gonna use a walker. We talk about proper mechanics of walking, which sets up good habits that, 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 that have positive um, effects on the, the rehab and maybe speed the process up of, of, of uh, getting to that point that people are happy that they had surgery. Um, you know, it's rough at first, um, but, but just those things that, that can be good, helpful temps that, uh, hints that um, keep them from worried, being worried about things that maybe they don't need to worry about. Um, I, I just think that makes a big difference. If it's a shoulder, um, you know, if it's a rotator cuff tear, partial tear, a lot of times people will come see us in the effort to try to not have surgery. Um, but if it seems to be a foregone conclusion, if they can restore, you know, passive range going in, if they don't go in with a stuck with a frozen shoulder, um, you know, again, all those things help the recovery afterwards to go maybe a little, maybe there's fewer, um, just problems that can develop, fewer complications that can, that can affect or delay um, the amount of time that they're happy with their outcome. Um, yeah, and that information is not intuitive. We weren't born or we weren't taught, we as human beings weren't taught this stuff in high school or something like that. And, and oftentimes in my patients, you know, the, the prehab concept is like almost an aha moment. Oh, I can do this, I can do this. What do you mean, really, I can do that? Yep. And it really kind of tamps down some of the anxiety and fear uh, going into it, because they now have some information to work with. Right. I, I have two personal experiences. I tore my ACL when I was a resident, and I couldn't have it reconstructed immediately because of timing of things, and so, I worked really hard on prehab. I had the best motion and best quad strength and control of anybody with an ACL torn. And so when I went through surgery, it was boom, I was back working pretty quickly and stuff because my I regained so much mobility so quickly. And then when I had my hip replacement, it was the same thing. I knew I was gonna have a hip replacement. So what I really worked on was flexibility and, and hip and thigh strength. Uh, and so my recovery was almost instantaneous because I knew what to do and I was prepared, my body was prepared mm -hmm. for that. The older person, the sedentary person, it's a tough go uh, when you're trying to rehab after these kind of reconstructed procedures, whether it's shoulder, knee, hip, ankle, etc. And so I think that's a good point that uh, education is power and um, a little bit of strength and flexibility goes a long way to help in your recovery uh, speed along and minimize the hiccups that may may show up with that. Right, right. And then just the educational component, you know, the, I call it the freak out factor. You know, there's, <laughs> Absolutely. there's, you know, patients will worry about every pain and what's normal, what's abnormal. And talking about like the hip replacement, you know, if you have hip replacement, well, by definition, you kind of have a crappy hip because you wouldn't be scheduled for that surgery otherwise. And there's a lot of things that you can't do, yep. but there's a bunch that you really can. That's really true. Um, you That's know, true. so you're not gonna have the hip replacement um, doing a lot of weight bearing activities because weight bearing is usually one of the triggers for their discomfort. Same thing for the knee. So we'll show this, those basics, get it straight, get it that, get your quads firing, those types of things. And for me, I like to, to really emphasize the things they're probably gonna do the first day post-op of surgery too. So they kind of know what to expect. Um, when they're coming back to us. Um, and then, you know, we establish that relationship before, we get trust, we get to, you know, get to know our patients a little bit um, that way. And, and then um, they feel a little more comfortable with us after they've had the surgery and they have this pain. And it's, you know, they, we, we kind of, hopefully helps to establish a little bit of credibility um, from that standpoint. They tend to be a little more at ease with what we tell them to do. That's well, I would imagine, you know, particularly if, they, if they're working with somebody who now they, it's a familiar face. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's a good thought. We weren't even planning to talk about prehab, but I just thought about it, so I don't know, anyway. Um, anything else on the ac uh, athletic training side of things? You know, we, before we came on the air, we were talking a little bit about, you know, history, where it's going, what's happening with it. Um, where are we from a TOA perspective in our, 
uh, and you may or may not know all this because you're really now a physical therapist mm -hmm. rather than just that right. a athletic trainer, but I know we have a lot of, we cover a lot of schools regionally. Um, we, ha we take care of a lot of young athletic uh, people um, in high schools and, and uh, middle schools. Um, where are we in the big picture of things as far as athletic training? Well, you know, the schools, um, you know, I'll speak for Rutherford County predominantly, but we have a, we have a, a reach that goes far outside of Rutherford County. I know um, there are lots of schools in Davidson County. I understand that Dr. Petty is the, 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 the team, team ortho, the team doctor for the Titans right, now. Right. Pretty cool to see some of those arrangements. We've taken care of Middle Tennessee State Athletics forever, it seems. Um, but our, you know, in terms of our high school athletic trainers, there, there's not a, a current law that each school has to have an athletic trainer. Each school, high school has an athletic trainer. Um, and of course, athletic trainers always will have relationships with their local physicians. Well, ours in Rutherford County have close relationships with our doctors, um, certainly in football and then intermittently with other sports. We, one of our doctors is on the sidelines pretty much every high school game in, right. in all of our Rutherford County schools. And, and as I say, that's not exclusive to Rutherford County. Um, that continues to be a good relationship. Um, we kind of have doctors that are kind of formally informally. I'll have to ask Dr. Jordan as to how that assignment occurs, but certain doctors tend to be, if they're um, in town and uh, affiliated they're, they're affiliated with a specific yeah. high school, which the coaches mm -hmm. like that, the families tend to like that, um, the athletic trainers certainly like that because they've got someone they can call that, hey, I've got this thing, and, you know, it, this injury. This condition, et cetera, they just have that that nice consistency. I think that really works that works well in, in, in our model. Um, but that you know, of course, through that we get to get to meet moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, and, and quite honestly, the body is a consumable item. They're they're going to have aches and pains that uh, have that, that that require orthopedic care, and we're obviously happy to get the opportunity to take care of those folks. I like that uh, that mantra of the body is a consumable item. I've never really used that, but I always. My argument is always you never win with the battle of father time. He, father time will always win. And so our, our goal here is to try to make that, that battle as, as tolerable as right. possible. Right. Unfortunately, well, there's some we're great still solutions around. Around. with yeah. joint replacements and whatnot. The outcomes are incredible. I mean, it's, uh, there are some wonderful solutions along those lines. But we also have, um, we have athletic trainers who participate um, clinically um, in the form of like our physical therapy technicians. We have... Um, an athletic trainer that does our functional capacity evaluations for our workers' comp patients. Um, you know, there's there's more there's more of a broad outreach. That's how we as STOA utilize our athletic utilize our, our athletic trainers. Athletic trainers are working more in the industrial setting. I know that Nissan has a number not not our folks, but right. uh, um, they have a number of athletic trainers that um, because of their experience with acute care and right. the ability to participate in rehabilitation. Um, the real ability to look look through their training um, at ergonomic types of things, um, ways to limit repetitive motion, things like that, making making suggestions along those lines. There, there's there's beginning there's beginning to be more and more utilization of athletic trainers in other settings um, that maybe aren't the traditional you know football field, basketball court um, types of situations. Oh, high school right, right, field, right, yeah. Right. Well, that's really, really cool. Um, anything else you'd like to mention, Chad? I think we're kind of going to wind it up, but um, anything else you can think of that would pique somebody's interest? Uh, how do you get into athletic training or physical therapy as a career locally? You know, what kind of venues there might be for uh, young, younger people interested in that as a possible career? Anything you want to well, I think for athletic training in particular, all most of the area high schools are going to have an athletic trainer and i'll say most of the time those athletic trainers are one person trying to take care of hundreds of athletes maybe they're not all in season but they're still their athletes so they don't have a lot of hands so a good way to kind of decide yes this is something i might want to do as a career would be to go approach that athletic trainer and say hey you know could i be your student trainer i'll bet you the answer is yes the vast majority of time um, and then that's a kind of a good way to know you know, is that something you might want to, to participate in? And then if it is, then you seek it out. Middle Tennessee State um, is, the, is, the, is the local institution that has an athletic training program. Um, UT Chattanooga has an athletic training education program. There are several private schools in, in Tennessee that have, have those programs. And for people that are interested in physical therapy, again, going and observing is a good opportunity. 
But to go to physical therapy school, you have to have an undergraduate degree before you apply to PT school now. Well, do I go get my undergraduate degree in something that, that if, if for some reason I don't get into physical therapy school or this, I decide that that's not what I want to do, probably won't do me a great deal of good. I can't go and directly be employed. Getting an undergraduate degree in athletic training makes a whole lot of sense to me. Not only is it good for your resume whenever you finish PT school and you're going to look at whatever jobs you might be interested in, um, but it also, if you decide not to go to PT school or you decide to delay or you decide to just, you know, that you don't get in, you know, God forbid, but not everybody gets into school. Um, if you have an athletic training degree, you go take your certification exam, you become licensed, you're employable. So you've got opportunities. It's hard to be employed if you've got a medieval English uh, fashion design uh, degree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, Sorry, it I mean, and those are great degrees, but that's, that's <laughs> it. Or exercise science, some of the other right. things. You're, either way, you're going to go on to more school with those types of types right. of degrees, and they're they're great. I mean, right. would never knock them. But I'm thinking, all right, you know, me as a person who might employ an athletic trainer, or if I employ a physical therapist, I love having that dual credential um, because you know more versatile, um, and and I think it it's it stands out you know, of other things that you can do to kind of boost your resume, um, that, 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 you know, think about the work ethic that you got to have in order to, to graduate with an athletic training degree, all the clinical, all the service learning hours, et cetera, that you do in addition to regular classroom work. It's, uh, you know, I think it, it, it stands pretty high, you know, if, 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 um, the, the decision makers in our office are looking at who's gonna, who are we going to hire this person or that person? And this person has the athletic training certification it, it, it's That's a big it's, plus it, it really is it really yeah. is well i mean i would definitely think hand for fresh out of school in particular hands-on like that uh background is far more valuable more wisdom is is in that person than just somebody who's been cracking a book right and they've so. dealt with hurt people yeah you know exactly. when you're actually you know interacting with someone that's in pain that's that's that, that, that's trying to recover from the surgery etc it, it's it it's it's different than some you know make believe person when you're in school. You know you, you learn how to treat patients by treating patients. You learn the fundamentals with 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 you know with what with the schooling part. But when you're actually dealing with real hurting people, it does it does change things a little bit. Well, it's always impressed me too that people with an athletic training background and physical therapy background, if those people love what they do. Mm -hmm. They love hands on interpersonal care with patients. I mean, everybody I've ever met. I can't say that about every physician I've ever met, but without a doubt, every physical therapist and every uh, athletic trainer that I've met and known, um, they do it because they love it. Mm -hmm. And um, they're driven by it, and that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, it's about relationships. It is, so. it is. It's, and making everybody's life a little bit better. Hopefully. You know? Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> Even if you sucked as an athlete. Right. 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 Yeah. Absolutely. I'm not saying you sucked, but uh, your middle tier, we'll say. Yeah, average at best. Yeah, I, was, I wasn't even close to that. <laughs> so uh, uh, anyway, well, Jimmy, thank you so much thank for being you. here. Thanks I know you me. took a trek to come up here from Murfreesboro, and I yeah, really appreciate it. Um, again, guys, um, uh, pretty interesting stuff. Um, this is, this is what TOA does. TOA is about education. TOA is about lifestyle improvement. TOA is about getting you as good as we can get you given the circumstances. So whether it's surgical, whether it's non-surgical, um, we wanna be here for you for your musculoskeletal health and care. Uh, again, go to toa.com, uh, learn. There's a lot of stuff. The media, we've changed our website a little bit. Uh, the media center is chock full of videos from all kinds of stuff. You can look at me if you really are that interested. You don't have to. Um, a lot of our doctors have put up uh, content that are uh, that's very valuable for just everyday life, and I think it's worth looking at. Um, go out there, enjoy your weekend. I am not going to be here the next two weeks. My wife and I are going to go enjoy the Low Country of South Carolina, so we'll see each other back uh, three weeks from now, I guess. And uh, until that time, go out there, live your best life, have a great weekend. Take care.